let me once again say welcome to this webinar. My name is Gwen Preston. I write the Resource Maven newsletters, and I'm excited today to be joined by Dave Cole of EMX Royalty. Uh, EMX, lots of things that I love about EMX. One thing that I noted just when I was going through my portfolio yesterday, what an incredibly stable share price um, of late when the rest of the sector has been sliding. And I think there's some good reason for that, as Dave, I'm sure, will get into when it's time for him to do his presentation. Um, but for now, I am going to do a little talking on my own. So here's what I want to talk about today, sort of gold and silver, why they're running, and what you should do about it. So um, I, I'm going to run through the fundamentals fairly quickly. I talk about this a lot in my newsletter. I think there has been a lot of talk in the last six, six months since COVID hit and interest rates were slammed to zero about why gold is performing, but it still deserves some comment because there's no point in investing in a sector unless there is fundamental reason to do so. And the primary fundamental reason right now is that we are in a very negative real rate situation and we are going to be there for a good period of time. This 10-year um, treasury um, inflation index chart shows you, it's a good proxy for real interest rates. So that's interest rates corrected for inflation. And you can see, you know, that first arrow points to when real rates started falling in 2016. That's when we got the first run of this bull market. Then rebounding real rates sort of hindered things for three years. Then you can see in 2019, real rates started falling again for a variety of reasons. So the gold market was already getting some momentum and then bam, COVID hit, interest rates were slammed to zero. Some inflation exists, the amount we could debate for some time, but that means that real rates are absolutely negative. And in terms of time frame, I think it's really important to remember it took the Federal Reserve seven years to raise interest rates following the great financial crisis, the last time they slammed rates down to zero. I don't know if it's gonna be seven years this time, but it's not gonna be one year. It's going to be an extended period of time because it takes an extended period of time for monetary actions to have effect. And so we are in a negative real rate environment and there's lots of reasons to believe that we will stay, we will stay there and likely go lower for the years to come. Another important factor in this, um, I almost took this slide out to simplify the talk, but then just in just yesterday, you know, the gold price didn't have fun yesterday. And why did the gold price struggle yesterday? Because the US dollar jumped. Why did the US dollar jump? Because the euro fell. That um, conversation I point out because gold in the moment on the day to day or when things happen in the macroeconomic world, Gold really reacts by proxy. Gold doesn't react in itself. It reacts by proxy to the US dollar or the euro or bonds or stocks, other things that are going on. The gold market is tiny relative to all of those things and it gets pushed around. But over time, in between those individual events, gold has its own forces at play. And so when you step back a bit, the negative real rate argument really matters. And bigger picture, rather than looking at day-to-day -day gyrations in the US dollar, there's a bigger picture reason to think that the days of ongoing US dollar strength are ending, whether you look at that because there's inflation coming from growth or money printing, from China reducing its reliance on the greenback, from the fact that the currency, reserve currency status is, is eroding in various ways over time because of debt loads, because of trade wars, there's good reason to believe, I think, that the US dollar has weaker days ahead and that will help gold. The other big and really important force that helps gold overall right now is that it is one of the only safe havens out there. The important thing here is the huge pools of low-risk capital that used to own bonds, always owned bonds, they now have to play stocks. They've had to play stocks since the great financial crisis because bonds don't pay. And that's okay except they are low risk pools of, of capital. So by definition, they have to hedge the risk in the stock market because even though the stock market is strong, the risks are very real. And there are very few options to hedge. Gold is one of the only ones that really steps forward to answer that question. So these are just examples of, I mean, the fact that bonds yield less than inflation and often come from extremely leveraged companies or governments. Uh, that's why bonds don't pay. And there's lots of evidence out there of the risks to the stock market. I am not, I have no crystal ball about what the stock market will do, 
but I do have confidence that low risk capital needs to hedge its exposure to that market. Then I also just want to point out there's a bunch of things that are certainly important in the market right now. The US election, very dominant. COVID, also very dominant. The trade war has taken a bit of a step back, but really still simmering and will resurface when it's given an opportunity. And what I love, to be honest, about that is gold works no matter which way any of these situations go. No matter which presidential candidate wins, there will be stimulus, there will be inflation, and we will be in a zero interest rate environment. That means negative real rates, that means gold does well. If there's a rise in COVID cases, then we get a flight to safety and definitely a zero interest rate environment. If there's a drop in cases, then we get growth-based inflation, but I'll tell you, still a zero interest rate environment for many years. Again, that works for gold. A trade war, same, if we get escalation, there's a flight to safety, there's more support for gold specifically from the Chinese, that works for gold. If there's de-escalation, then guess what? We should have faster growth, more inflation in a zero interest rate environment. So I think it really matters that gold is set up to succeed no matter how those important things turn out. Okay, so if all of these things are aligning and they all make so much sense, why is gold dipping right now? Really, it's because markets these days are absolutely dependent on stimulus. And we don't know when that next package is going to come. The package that almost happened was taken off the table when Justice Ginsburg died. And now between the election, the likelihood of some form of lame duck period, whether because of changes in seats in the House and Congress and things like that, or because of a different president, we don't know when the next package is going to come. And so growth and inflation expectations are down. And that has direct impact on gold. Gold rose so significantly in July and August because inflation expectations rose. Um, and you can see that they're down. That's what I have circled on that five-year five year forward inflation expectation rate chart. Oh, is that a long enough name for a chart? Anyway, um, why else the dip? There's certainly some flight to the US dollar um, as a safety move. And because the Euro is weak, why is the Euro weak? Well, you know, that new daily coronavirus cases per million residents chart gives you one indication for sure, France being the outlier there. Uh, lockdowns are happening again in Europe and that's the opposite of stimulus. And so that prompts Euro weakness, which prompts dollar strength. Um, and overall COVID rising um, just puts everyone in that sort of step back and be worried position. If you wanna focus a little bit more on the juniors in our space, um, there's a few other factors at play. Um, Free trading dates are absolutely having an important effect. A huge number of companies raised capital May through August during that period of gold strength, and all of those shares are coming free to trade sort of September through December. So those free trade dates push back on gains that have happened in the four month period, especially if the financing had a warrant. You can see that happening in lots of share price charts out there. It's just part of the way that this market works, but it's an important force to be aware of. Super slow assay labs are also not helping. It's taking twice as long, if not longer, for companies to get their results. So investors get antsy, companies are bereft of news. That's just challenging for everyone. And profit taking, you can't begrudge some selling after a great summer from mining investors who've waited a long time for those kinds of gains. Overall, this bull market is going. And so the question that everyone needs to answer is how are you going to profit? And I've been, I would say harping on about this a little bit of late, but I think it's really important. You don't have to be an expert to do well in a precious metals market. You do have to understand the forces enough to decide that you're in a bull market, watch those forces enough to know when it starts to change, which I think is several years out, and then you have to know yourself. You have to decide how much time you want to commit to your portfolio and how much risk you want to take on then you can set expectations that you're gonna meet. You'll have more fun and you'll be more successful if you play a game that's appropriate for you. The bottom line is that whether you trade explorers on a daily basis or whether you invest in major mining companies, it all works, everything in between. It just all works with different timelines, risks and needs in terms of your portfolio. These are just examples. I mean, the GDX is up 42% year over year. That's not like from the COVID bottom, that's just year over year. That's a great gain. Evergold is an example of a stock that 
is an example of a high risk exploration stock. It was up 300%, but it's an exploration stock, so it's a roller coaster. They're very different games to play. So you have to decide which one is appropriate for you. If you want to do the exploration speculation side of things, I would uh, encourage you to always remember that it's not easy and that the odds of success are low. Strong markets mean more companies have money, so there's more discoveries happening. But remember that the odds of success on any one target remain low. The way to um, balance that geologic risk is, I think, to demand that there's more than one strong target or project within a company, more kicks at the can, that the company has strong technical competence and rationale for the targets that they're pursuing. This isn't pick up a project and, oh, let's go drill it. This is a well-developed approach with um, appropriate expertise applied. And they have a business plan that makes sense. EMX is a great example of that, and I'm sure Dave will talk through that as part of his conversation shortly. But there needs to be a business plan, a plan to create value in the near, medium, and long term for investors. This isn't a science project. This is about making money. And a lot of companies, unfortunately, don't focus enough on the how are we going to make money side of it. So really uh, drill down on them for that. And then geology is risk enough. There's other risks that you want to make sure are managed, like permits, seasonality, access, marketing. Do they know how to tell their story and, and make it all happen? In addition, if you like explorers, I, I always like to say you have to stay engaged with the stock, but you have to make sure you don't get too attached. And part of that is you got to trade. You've got to buy in tranches. And then you have to use pressures, whether that's price gains on speculation, whether it's price falls on free trade dates, whether it's seasonal impacts, whether it's a spike because of a discovery, you need to use those to lower your risk. You need to sell some or add based on movements in the stock. Don't get too attached. Remember, it's about making money. Participate in financings if that's possible for you for the warrant side of things and own a lot of stocks. It's just like how you want a single company to have multiple targets. You want your portfolio to have multiple companies because a basket has a better odds of uh, kicking out something that does really well. And I would say in that basket, you wanna cover a range, pre-discovery, discovery expansion, project generators, different geologies, right? Some porphyry, porphyry versus high-grade veins, the market reacts differently to different um, types of geologies and types of discoveries. The market also tends toward, tends to like fall in love with a particular jurisdiction and then ease away from it. So just make sure that your portfolio has some scale and range to it. Right now, if you are a speculator, I think you should also be thinking about tax law selling. It's been a volatile year. There's been slides in the last few months. If, you, if you're down on some positions, you probably want to lock in some of those losses to offset gains that hopefully you sold into when things were strong two months ago. We're also far enough ahead of the end of the year that if you sell now, you can rebuy in December and it won't be considered, you will still be able to use the loss for a tax loss and you can reposition in those stocks at perhaps the same price. And then you can also use current weakness to um, add to favorites. Stocks that you like may well be on sale relative to a few months ago and to where the market is likely to go in the first quarter. Time your entry in those by paying attention to those pressures, the free trade dates, news flow, things like that. Um, and it is impossible to time when this market will bottom. So consider using tranches and stink bids. And then I just want to finish by saying, if all of that seems like a lot, it's because it is. <laughs> Exploration speculation is a risky and time consuming game that requires a fair bit of knowledge, but you can build a buy and hold portfolio that will perform through this market and doesn't require much attention or carry much risk. Buy large mining companies. That's why Warren Buffett bought Barrick. Big money buys big companies with strong financials and good dividends. Big money is coming to gold. That's who they're going to buy. You can go for scale that also has extra growth upside because of um, built-in organic growth profiles. You can look at royalty companies. We're clearly about to go through the royalty model with Dave here in a moment, but royalty companies are the lowest risk way to play the space. And royalty companies have outperformed miners in the bear bull market, in the bear market, and in the bull market. It's a pretty solid track record. It's hard to argue with that. You can play optionality. Big assets are specifically hated in bear markets, 
But once a bull market gets going, because they're so expensive to advance, but once a bull market gets to the point where big companies need to start buying the big assets that will enable them to stay big, there's hardly any big projects left on the table because they were so hated. And so everybody suddenly starts chasing the few big assets that are around. You can look for takeout targets. That's a that's another side of the optionality thing. And make sure you don't ignore silver. Silver usually outperforms gold in every bull market. End of the day, we're set up for a few very exciting years in gold and silver. Corrections like we're in right now are part of the process. So I encourage you to consider how much focus and risk you want to commit. There's no right answer. There's just a right answer for you. And then with that answer, build a portfolio that works, that will be satisfying, um, and that makes sense for um, for your parameters. And then stick to that plan. Try not to have fear of missing out because you see, you know, an exploration stock spike. If that's not your game, that's not your game. And then find a few good sources of information. I think that's really important. I'm also somewhat biased because I uh, try to position myself as precisely that. I write newsletters about what I am buying, selling, and thinking to help investors profit from metals and mining. So with that, I have said what I would like to say, and I would love to hand the um, mic, so to speak, over to Dave to run us through the EMX story, um, which is a story that I've been invested in for a very long time um, and remain committed to because uh, in my, from my, from where I stand, it just keeps getting better. Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gwen. That was an excellent summary. Yeah, fabulous. Your readership is uh, lucky to have that advice, in my view. So, um, EMX Realty Corporation, we've been around for 17 years now, and um, you you spoke to the attributes of the business model. You know I'm passionate about that, Gwen, so you know, I'll go into some detail about that. Uh, we've gone back and, and calculated our compounded annual growth rate of our share price uh, throughout our history as part of our analysis of our business and, and thinking about what works and what doesn't work and how we fine tune this model over time. And we've been public for 17 years. Um, our compounded annual growth rate over that 17 year period uh, is right around 17%. Um, and we're quite proud of that. And as Gwen said, you know, the royalty companies have outperformed in various markets and, and throughout the cycles now for for a few different cycles and a few different, a few combined decades. That speaks to the fact that royalties are phenomenal financial instruments. And that's due to their embedded optionality, um, commodity price optionality, of course, which over the long haul is usually positive, but very importantly, discovery optionality, engineering advancement optionality, new metallurgical technology, invention optionality, if you will, all these different things that are, that compound, that are to the royalty holders benefit because in most cases, royalties are a slice off the gross revenue and require no additional capital to put in once they're owned. And there's a variety of different ways that you can obtain royalties, of course. And we'll talk about that when we go into details about um, how EMX approaches this for it to be particularly astute allocation of capital with respect to growing the royalty portfolio. But let's zero in on the slide right now. Um, this is obviously cherry picked. It's cherry picked to the beginning of the bull market that we're in right now, which was roughly the end of 2015, January 2016 for five years to, to approximately today. This is a few days out of date, but not too bad. And over that period, we've had a 35% compounded annual growth rate over five years, which is excellent. Um, I have the opinion that we're still distinctly undervalued relative to the uh, optionality and the royalties that we have embedded in our portfolio today. So we have a chance for this um, this uh, repricing, positive repricing of EMX to continue into the future as we grow this portfolio. But but taking out this cherry picked um, cycle graph and, and looking at the whole history of the company, it's been 17% compounded annual growth rate um, from the very beginning. And um, you know, if you if you did that same calculation for the other major royalty companies, they typically are nice positive numbers. And when you do a comparative analysis to the producers, you'll see that um, um, the royalty companies have outperformed for the reasons that I've just mentioned. So let's go and talk about the business model and how we approach the royalty business is definitely unique as compared to our competitors. The dominant number of royalties on our portfolio were built through royalty generation 
which is execution of the prospect generation business model focused on the royalty component. So we acquire large tracts of prospect and mineral rights around the world. We add value by doing good geology. We sell those to an industry hungry for discovery opportunities in exchange for work commitments, annual cash payments, stage gate payments, and always a royalty on the back end. We also get shares um, when we do deals with junior companies, and we've done very, very well with the shares that we have been paid uh, over the years to help augment our treasury. And to um, um, augment this portfolio that we grow organically, the same team of economic geologists that are out executing this business model around the world are also looking for royalties to buy. And some of the key royalties we have in our portfolio, we were able to buy. And uh, make no mistake about it, buying royalties is an extraordinarily competitive space. And uh, everybody understands that they have immense value long term. Uh, and so they tend to trade at um, quite high prices and high valuations. So it's really by utilizing economic geology skill sets um, and, and business acumen that we're able to, that's our alpha, that we're able to identify key royalties to buy uh, that uh, based upon our interpretation actually look like good value. And we really focus on that. And, and I will entirely admit that the royalty space of recent has been a momentum game. People have been paying nearly any price that they can to be able to accumulate and build a portfolio and make news releases. Uh, we're a value player within that space. I joked with Gwen before that, you know, we're a value player in a momentum game, uh, which has its challenges. But that, that's, our, that's our core um, uh, instinct uh, and value, if you will. Our, our, our value is to be a value player. And uh, we approach this from a standpoint that it's all about astute allocation of capital. I know that I can grow royalties through the organic methodology very inexpensively long term. And um, um, if we can knock off some royalty purchases along the way that are accretive, more power to us. The, the third thing that we do that makes us unique is the fact that that same team also identifies strategic investment opportunities. And there's excellent synergy because the same guys that are doing the organic growth, they're in Finland, Norway, Sweden, uh, Arizona, Nevada, finding opportunities to, to acquire, to, to build up and to sell and keep royalties. They say, hey, we need to own this company's stock. And so we've made a dozen or more strategic investments in our history and our return on allocated capital to this portion of our business uh, has been fantastic. It's a 40% internal rate of return after tax, which is excellent. And uh, that uh, it is liquidations of various strategic investments throughout our history that put us in a very strong financial position today. Uh, so we're sitting here with 54 million Canadian dollars in the bank, a portfolio of tradable securities that we have either invested in or have been paid to us part and parcel to our deals that's uh, worth in excess of 20 million uh, Canadian dollars in round numbers today, plus some long-term investments on top of that, that um, accumulate up to more money and working capital or equal, roughly equal to all the money we've raised in the entire history of the company. In addition to the 250 mineral property assets that we have, uh, of which of roughly 150 of those are now royalties. So that's definitive that this business model works. Well, we've executed this model and fine-tuned it over the course of multiple cycles and uh, continue to accrete value. So let's take a look at the global uh, map for EMX. I did hit the advance button and it didn't move, so maybe it's not working now. You guys can go ahead and next it for me if you'd like. There it goes. Hopefully it's not delayed and it doesn't flip through a couple of pages. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. The, uh, so this is our global map. And you can see from this map that you know, we're quite active in the Western United States. We have, ex we have uh, um, uh, a partial ownership through royalties or 100% ownership of over 10,000 mining claims in the Western United States with big holdings in, in Arizona. I believe we're the third largest mineral rights holder in Arizona and the big copper belts there right in and around some of the big discoveries uh, that have been made in huge copper mines in Arizona. Likewise, in the gold fields of, of uh, Nevada. And then recently, we purchased a portfolio from Perry English, who's a private prospect generator, executing a similar business model to ours, but on a private basis. And he was nearing retirement and sold us his entire portfolio in the, in the Superior Geologic Province, which is in the um, uh, Ontario and Quebec um, provinces of Canada. So we're now happy to have a solid footprint with over 60 mineral property assets in Canada. And we tend to utilize that 
as a springboard for, con for continued organic growth, um, as we believe that Central and Eastern Canada is an excellent place uh, to have exposure. We were looking for the right catalyst to be able to do that. And speaking of catalysts to build upon, we also bought quite inexpensively. Um, I should point out, by the way, before I move on, that the Perry English portfolio has a payback of three and a half years. And uh, this speaks to the concept of us you know, being very careful about how we're allocating capital here. And that payback is achieved through pre-production payments and share payments that come in part and parcel to the deals uh, that are within that portfolio. So it'll be positive cash flow actually within three and a half years. So another uh, portfolio we bought very astutely, very, very inexpensively, that gives us exposure to some fantastic um, um, belts of, of, of mineral endowment in Chile is the portfolio we bought from Ravello. Uh, Ravello was a struggling prospect generator that had uh, 18 royalties on their books and they sold that off to us and, and we're delighted to have those and be able to carry those forward and, and uh, we got them uh, at a very nice price. And likewise, we'll use that as a springboard to continue to build our portfolio in South America and execute the business model. An area of the world where we've been super active now for many years is Fennoscandia. Um, I believe we're amongst, if not the largest mineral rights holder now in Fennoscandia. I know individually we're the largest mineral rights holder um, in Norway, and I believe the second largest in Sweden, and a substantial growing portfolio in Finland as well. And here we're targeting strategic metals, battery metals, and precious metals. And uh, a number of the different um, uh, business uh, um, deals that we've executed here are, are of the, the type that we like a lot, where we package up a portfolio of, say, gold projects on the gold line in central Sweden, which is a multi-million ounce endowed structure in central Sweden with a number of advancing discoveries there. We have 14 licenses that we picked up in the downturn, the gold price, taking advantage of that. We always try to think ahead with respect to the cycles of metal prices, take advantage of downturns to acquire mineral real estate, package those up, PI Financial is backing the company that, is, that has been advancing this as a, on a private basis. It's about to go public called uh, Gold Line Resources, named after the gold line in Sweden. And we're more than happy to be participants in that as shareholders, as well as royalty holders on those projects. That gives us even greater optionality because we can win through the shares, we can win through the royalties, we can win incrementally from the pre-production annual payments that we have coming in from those just as one example. And we've done that multiple times throughout the portfolio. But we have three mines being built on our projects that we have generated organically in Turkey over the years. Most importantly is Balya, which has a 4% uncapped unbuyable royalty and that mine's going into full scale commercial production in 21. And another mine that's going into commercial production in the latter part of 21 is the embedded company maker in our portfolio. And that's the one half of 1% royalty in the Timuk Magmatic Complex, covering the Timuk project, also known as the Brestovac discovery, now being advanced by Xinjiang. And uh, we're very, very, very excited about that one. Uh, that one has a huge endowment. The upper zone will be a nice cash flow and royalty for us, but when they get into the lower zone porphyry, that's a, that's a massive deposit, 1.7 billion tons of 0.86% copper and 0.18 grams per ton gold, 12 drill rigs turning on the property, expanding the mineral resources there. Uh, that long term, that's an immense asset for EMX. And uh, um, that's a great example of positive optionality within the portfolio. So I'm hitting the, oh yeah, it works this time. So we talked about the value drivers in the Western United States, um, you know, major property positions in and around some of the largest deposits. These, for the most part, are being advanced by, by major companies. We love to have major companies working on, on our projects where they're employing their expertise, their money in the ground. We get annual payments. We get royalties on the back end. Um, and in some cases uh, within this portfolio, there's million dollar drill holes being drilled at no cost to us. And that's what creates this immense optionality within the portfolio. I'd like to point out that we have 19.9% interest in the producing rawhide gold silver mine that's a strategic investment and uh, uh, we're very pleased about that I'll, I'll i'll give you a little more detail about that forthcoming uh, of course our cash flow and royalty in nevada and we're quite pleased to have multiple uh, business deals with south 32 they're a great company to work with we have a regional strategic alliance where they fund our generative work in exchange for first rights to pick our projects 
to make uh, to make them into designated projects and advance those. Um, and uh, we like deals like that, and we've enjoyed working with South 32. So Barrick is now the operator of the Leeville mine as part of the Nevada Gold Mine Joint Venture with Newmont in uh, throughout Nevada. And they continue to find more gold. This royalty, so 1% overriding gross royalty, has paid us $14 million since we've owned it, and pays every month. And Barrick keeps finding more gold and more infrastructure continues to be developed, including the $300 million turf vent shaft uh, that was built a number of years ago. And there's now three shafts and two declines which access the underground infrastructure here. Barrick, uh, in every press release uh, where they come out, uh, they highlight this asset and they highlight the continued discovery here. Um, I, early in my career when I worked for Newmont, I was involved in deciphering the geology here and testing the down dip extent of the Carlin mine and finding these mineral resources. And it's, and it's really fantastic to sit here today, decades later, and see that that, um, that work was the beginning of something that just continues to bear fruit. And I'm delighted to, to be a recipient of that now with a royalty on this property. So um, that's, that's, that's super. Barrick, um, I encourage you to go to the Nevada Gold Mines website, look at their PowerPoint presentation, and you can see the updates that they give on this property. Long term, uh, that's going to be a key asset for us. We bought the 19.9% interest in Rawhide um, at $1,400 gold. We thought it was an excellent investment at that point in time. Subsequent to that, the Regent deposit, which is the next open pit to be advanced within that district, came into production um, uh, without uh, too many hiccups. And uh, we're now pouring about 125 ounces of Doré a day on average um, at this operation. And I can tell you that at $1,900 gold, uh, this is just a phenomenal investment. Unfortunately, it does not, it does not have a, yet a 43101 report, so I can't give specifics about cost and the resource and whatnot. That'll be forthcoming once the 43101 report is completed. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have a, a, a average of 40% internal rate of return on our invested capital through our strategic investments, and I don't think this one's going to hurt that number. And uh, uh, so, you know, we're looking forward to, the, to um, um, different business maneuvers, including just dividends coming from it, but also the potential to roll this into a public company or do other business transactions uh, where we can actuate value uh, more quickly. The um, um, you heard me talk about the portfolio we acquired in Canada. Delighted to be a Canadian company with Canadian assets now, and uh, we have some good expertise um, there that is going to continue to springboard this forward. Lots of great names for counterparties here that are working on our assets. This pays for itself in three and a half years. Actually, at today's share prices, it'll be positive cash flow in three and a half years, plus all that embedded optionality from having exposure to 60 properties here and so um, uh, delighted to to have a presence in Canada Gwen and uh, the uh, you know how active we've been um, in Svenoscandia led by uh, Dr. Eric Jensen one of one of several just absolutely fantastic economic geologists that we have here on the team that are executing this business model around the world and Eric's done a phenomenal job of acquiring prospective mineral rights and building relationships with the people in the mining industry throughout Fennoscandia. And we're recognized uh, in Fennoscandia as a major player there now. Hard not to, um, because hard not to run into our, our, our claim ownership, our, <laughs> our exploration license ownerships. And multiple deals have been done where we've sold these off the way we like to do it. Um, and to get shares, annual payments, royalties. And it's a super model. We're targeting strategic metals, battery metals, and precious metals. Those are good places to be long-term in my view, Gwen. And uh, so one, you know, we'd like to talk about optionality and how you just never know where the next big surprise is gonna come from. We bought this royalty. This was one, you know, the same guys out doing the generative work, identify royalties to buy. Eric Jensen identified this royalty. We bought it quite inexpensively, quarter of a million Canadian dollars. Um, and 1% can be bought out for a million dollars, leaving us with 1% long-term. And Palladium One has done a fantastic job. They just continue to find more copper, nickel, platinum, palladium, and gold in this mafic rock associated metal system. And they've been stepping out and, and substantially increasing the strike length on this system. 
And uh, we're delighted to be a participant in that and hats off to their quality work. Um, they've got some of the best mafic rock geologists in the world on their advisory board that are helping them out here. And, and, and uh, um, I'm, I'm quite impressed with what they're doing. Uh, long term, this could be a phenomenal asset for a ridiculously low price that we paid. And that speaks to this idea that, you know, we're value players. We're looking for the really good deals here. The um, Turkey, we've cycled through over 250 licenses. Uh, we were an early player into Turkey. Um, I was the exploration manager of Turkey at, with Newmont before I left to found EMX Royalty Corporation. Utilizing that that expertise and the team that we had on the foot on the ground there to acquire properties. Net result today, three mines being built, the most important of which is Balia, which has a 4% uncapped, uh, unviable royalty, 5,000 ton per day mill, tailings pond all, already all constructed, uh, and uh, advancing a spiral decline into the zone of mineralization at Hassan Tepe. We're expecting this to go into full-scale commercial production in mid to late 21. This will have um, um, royalty income flow to us that will be in the multiple millions of dollars per annum for many years into the future. And uh, we're, we're quite excited about that. Uh, there have been a lot of drilling recently to, to further define and expand uh, that mineral resource. And we're delighted with those results. So I mentioned the company maker in the portfolio, which is uh, in the Timuk Magmatic Complex. The Timuk, by the way, is uh, Europe's largest historic copper and gold producing region. Uh, we came in to the, the, the uh, Serbia actually um, just after the Balkan Wars and advised the Serbian government with respect to their mining law and their concession law, became the first company to be granted exploration licenses in that country in many decades and sold it off part and parcel to our business unit, our, our business model, excuse me to Reservoir, and Reservoir did an excellent job of advancing that. We then bought additional royalties to augment the portfolio of royalties that we grew organically, which speaks to the power of doing both sides, buying royalties and growing them in the same district. And now we're sitting here today with the royalty on what is uh, arguably the, the largest and most important copper gold development story in the world. And um, um, it's a half of 1%, uh, the upper high grade zones going into production in 21 as per the memorandum of understanding with the Serbian government, where Xinjiang, the current owner and counterparty to this royalty, is investing 474 million USD uh, in infrastructure to advance that. They already own a mill, they already own a smelter that they bought from the Serbian government in the Bor district. So the, the, the smelter's right here, the mill's right there, the tailings pond's right there, and it's a huge deposit with a high-grade pipe above the big porphyry zone, the big porphyry zone when it goes into production is when this royalty explodes in value and that's the 1.7 billion tons of um, roughly 1% uh, copper equivalent grade uh, and uh, you can do the math on what that might be worth to a half percent royalty holder. There's no cap on this royalty um, and uh, cannot be bought out. So. Um, there it is. So, you know, a super track record from doing strategic investments, putting us in a strong cash position today. More good strategic investment uh, wins uh, likely within our portfolio. I don't think anybody generates royalties the way we do. We've generated through the execution of this model 50 new royalties by selling 50 projects in the last three years, Gwen. And um, um, we do the best we can at buying royalties. Uh, the ones we buy are good value and continue to build this portfolio. And uh, so far we have um, you know, not done what our competitors done, which is to overpay for, uh, at least within our view, um, for, for royalty portfolios. And there's excellent incipient cash flow in here from the assets bubbling up within our pyramid, coming up to the top of the pyramid and becoming producing. And, and uh, I think the next few years are gonna be, um, we're gonna see a continued upward repricing as the market better reflects the full value of our portfolio that we've built, Gwen. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. Um, that was, I mean, you've done this many times. Um, that was a great summary. It's a difficult, it's always difficult to summarize a royalty story, especially when there's the project generation side and all of that. But I think, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that carried us through quite well. A good number of questions have come in. If anybody else has questions, please 
click the, I think it's a hand icon, like as though you're putting up your hand, um, and you can enter questions <coughs> in the question box. I see those and I will pass them along. Dave, I'm gonna start, with, there's there's half a dozen that are sort of quite uh, concise questions. Um, so we'll just, we'll get through those before diving into some of the meatier perhaps topics. Uh, so the first one is how many technical people does EMX employ to try and um, keep abreast of 250 mineral projects around the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get asked this question often. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, I'll point out that I, I believe Franco has a thousand royalties. So, you know, <laughs> we're not the only one that, that has to manage a big portfolio. And that's a good thing. I firmly have the belief you cannot own enough royalties, right? Uh, when, they, when they're in capable counterparties' hands and you have well-written documents, and then you have that into a, um, a, um, a, a proper program that manages those and flags the dates of which payments are due, and work commitments have to be completed by and whatnot, and you have somebody who's following up on that within the broader context of the legal commercial team, uh, then it's not as onerous as it sounds, but it definitely requires people to pay attention. Uh, and But to specifically answer the question, technical people, we're in the mid-20s uh, worldwide, but that would include uh, full-time geologists, uh, that would include contract uh, geologists, uh, many of whom have, uh, you know, are incredibly well-paid uh, consultants. Excuse me, well-published consultants. They also get well are well-paid too. <laughs> the well-published consultants with strong track records in the business, and it's fantastic to have access to them. And they would be people that we might use a few days a year, all the way up to half or three quarters time and everything in between. So it's in the mid-20 range. Certainly we do hire a lot of summer hires, so I'm not sure I would include them in that number, uh, but we have a lot of, of, of summer hires uh, that are helping out with field work. Gotcha, okay. Um, what, uh, when you're going through your portfolio or your um, global por uh, asset portfolio, some of them are labeled as available. Someone was, someone was just asking for yeah. clarification on precisely what available means. Yeah, uh, excellent question. Available means that we own it 100% and we're actively marketing it to an industry that is hungry for discovery opportunities. So we go into Nevada. We, we, we conceptualize an interesting goal play. We might work on accumulation of the property for anywhere from you know a few weeks to a few years in some cases and not talk about it until we really cemented the property position we like. We then help build the geologic model. We might do some surface sampling, some, uh, some mapping, assimilate data, and then market that to the industry and get it sold. And so the ones that are available are things we own 100% that we're actively marketing to the industry. And I'm sure, this is just my comment from many conversations with you over the years, you know, cementing those deals, um, first of all, takes up a lot of your time, but that's integral to the business model, uh, so it should. Um, but my comment is that in this burgeoning royalty world, your experience negotiating deals, both on the sell and on the buy side, I think is a is one of EMX's big strengths. How I'm just throwing in a question here, but how has your perspective on negotiating deals evolved over 17 years of doing it? I mean, yeah, you have a lot of competition now, but you have far more experience than most players. Mm -hmm. You know, the original template that I paid attention to were the deals that um, Lyle Campbell, who was a famous and successful prospect generator on a private basis in Nevada, He's now passed away. I met him uh, early in my geologic career. I was really impressed with what a hard-nosed negotiator he was. And um, uh, I was working for Newmont at the time. And he was adamant that, you know, in his royalty deals, he had to have X, Y, and Z, you know, rights to data, rights to tour the property, uh, rights to audit, all these things. And so I made, paid very close attention to that. So, I, you know, we had, a, had that to use as a springboard to move forward. Uh, but, um, um, you know, We've refined our skill sets through executing this business model over 17 years. But here, a pitch to the team, I want to say specifically, is that guys like Dave Johnson and Eric Jensen and the people on this team have uh, just continued to further advance their commercial skill sets and negotiating skill sets here to the benefit of our counterparties. Um, we're looking for win-win deals here. We want everyone to do well. We do well when the project does well, um, and but specifically also to, of course, our shareholders. For sure. Um, a sort of a related question, one of these specific ones that came in is what does EMX stand for? And of course that's related because you changed your name a few years ago. So uh, let's touch on that. Well, you know, we started life as, as Eurasian Minerals. 
and our ticker symbol on the on the TSX uh, exchange was uh, EMX. And people over time started calling us EMX. You know, you refer to companies by their ticker symbol, and EMX seems to roll off the tongue nicely. And of course, uh, we were prospect generator. We were always focused on the royalty component. But over time, the fruits of our labor became a royalty portfolio. And I had large shareholders say, Dave, you need to have the word royalty in your name so people understand that you're not just an exploration company, that the products that you're creating through the execution of that model are royalties. So we thought about it and decided to, to just change our name to EMX Royalty, but it's the same business, same people, same portfolio as was Eurasian Minerals. And um, uh, our ticker symbol on the New York Stock Exchange is also EMX. Absolutely. Also, uh, when you started, Eurasian was perhaps a geographic focus and that's no longer appropriate. Right. It didn't <laughs> take long for us to expand beyond those boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, another very specific question. Do you have a, a estimate on the timeline to that 43101 report on Rawhide? Yeah, it, it's 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 going to be a couple months still. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know, it's a uh, private company and they don't, they're not mandated to do that. So they're doing it on behalf of us and Austral, another public company that is a share, a share owner in that. And uh, um, they have the added challenge of more data coming in all the time. So you know how that, you know, those things tend to get pushed out into the future, but yeah, there sure. will be a time when we can talk about the details. <laughs> and I'm sure you're excited for that time. Um, what uh, can you speak to EMX management as shareholders in the company? How, yeah, how significant they are buying? Yeah. I, I think on a fully diluted basis, we're right around 15% right now. Um, and uh, uh, prior to the recent run up in the stock price, there was a lot of insider buying, particularly on, on behalf of myself. Uh, I bought stock out of the open market for seven years, so exercised options and paid the tax and kept the shares. Uh, and I did that uh, uh, for seven years and, and, and uh, continued to, to increase my position. Um, I think on a fully diluted basis, I'm somewhere around 4% right now uh, and happy to, happy to be there. I, I, you know, I, I think that, um, I think this business is working very well. Just while we're on the topic of shareholders, do you want to speak a little bit to the EMX shareholder registry? Because that's also, I think, an important part of the story and one of the key reasons that the share price, as I mentioned way at the beginning, has been so stable through what we would say is a dip in the market in the last few months. Yeah, we have the benefit of some of some folks that have deep understanding of what we're doing and um, utilize downturns as opportunities to add stock. And um, you know, Paul Stevens will be top of the list. He's our largest shareholder. Uh, and he has accumulated the bulk of his shares, almost all of them have been off the open market. And he controls, I, I, I think I estimate that to be around 15% in various accounts that he has. Uh, and uh, he's an aficionado of, of the royalty business. Um, he was an early shareholder in Franco and he likes to expound upon what a great uh, success that it was. And, and I believe he's bought and sold Franco a few times and tripled it each time in, in his career. And, and he likes to talk about that, uh, um, you know, uh, owning royalties is powerful. Um, and then of course there's Rick Rule and his whole group and all the followers at, at Sprott Global, uh, they accumulate up to a big number. I don't know the exact number, Gwen, but if you include the retail shareholders that are within the Sprott Global um, network, uh, then I, I, you know, I think you might be looking at something around 30%. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's a pretty tightly held stock. There's not a lot of loose uh, loose shares available out there. And um, my alma mater, Newmont Mining Corporation, they own close to 6%, I think 5.8, something like that. Uh, they've participated in a few different private placements, and we're delighted to have Newmont uh, as a shareholder. Okay, uh, another specific question, but it gets a little bit towards uh, some other topics. So... Current mm -hmm. annual cash flow and what does it cover in terms of your expenses? Yeah, so I knew you were going to ask that. So I actually had a CFO. I actually, somebody else asked. <laughs> I would have asked. <laughs> anyway. Somebody else had the question. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, yeah, so right now we have fifty-four million Canadian dollars in cash, and as I mentioned, you know, I think the the um, um, I think the, the tradable securities uh, roughly twenty million dollars right now. The uh, but cash flow was the question. So. Um, three and a half million dollars coming from royalties and and stage gate payments. Uh, that does not include share payments. 
share payments um, so far in the last 12 months uh, add up to uh, about a million, another million and a half on top of that. So that put it into close to $5 million. Um, then we have expenditures that are recovered from partners. So we're doing the work, but they're paying us back. That's not actually income, but just for the sake of knowledge, because we like to talk about the amount of money that other people are spending on our properties to help advance them. That's in the, um, that's in the um, uh, right around the 10 or $11 million range in Canadian dollars uh, over the last 12 months. So that does not include the work that is being done by somebody like Xinjiang, where they're spending money directly into the project. This are, those are the ones where we're spending the money on the property and then get it reimbursed. So put those into different baskets. It's a complicated uh, business with multiple facets. And so money's come into different, different uh, spots. And so I know this is a topic that you and I have reviewed um, many times, uh, but then, you know, when it comes down to, to how does that pan out from the recurring income, not just the big gains we make on strategic investments. If you include the strategic investing gains, for example, the big one we had at the, at the end of 2018, then we've been positive cash flow for a long time. But if you look at just the income we have coming in from royalties and stage gate payments relative to the amount of money that we're investing in growing that portfolio, that's mm -hmm. a negative number. You know, we're, we're still... Uh, investing more money in the ground than we are taking out, and that uh, accumulates up to to you know six seven million dollars a year. And and believe me, uh, this decision to continue to invest more in our portfolio than we are bringing in from current royalty payments is is very well thought out. We absolutely are firmly of the belief that that's accretive for us to be aggressively acquiring more mineral rights. And, and funding acquisitions in Fennel Scandia, for example. And uh, uh, we've made up for that long-term with strong investment gains. We have incipient investment gains on the books, in my opinion. And so this is the right way to manage that treasury. However, eventually we do need to become positive cash flow on a recurring basis, not just from investment gains. And that will come. And the big catalyst for that occurring is going to be Balia coming into full scale commercial production and the uh, team of project coming into production. Yeah, for sure. You sort of led me into where I was going to go next, yeah. which is you obviously have this big amount in your bank account right now. And you always get questions about how you're what you're planning to do to deploy that. And I think mm -hmm. the assumption is you're looking for uh, deals that would put you in that positive cash flow bracket. Mm -hmm. But even if we yep. didn't um, consider that, because we can't calculate that, because we don't know what the deals are, um, yep. how do Balia and Timok play into the positive cash flow uh, outlook for EMX if we sort of look out two years from now when both of those are mm -hmm. likely spitting out money? Mm -hmm. So the uh, there was a 43101 uh, compiled by Nefson when they owned the the Timok project. They've subsequently sold that to Xinjiang. Xinjiang, um, uh, of course, we have some information from their website, and we also have information from the Memorandum of Understanding they signed with the Serbian government, so we know when that's coming into production. And if we go back and talk about the 43101 that was filed, which will, thus allows me to give you specific information, um, then it's going to average about two and a half million dollars per annum payment to EMX at uh, I think that's at uh, fourteen hundred dollar gold. So it'd be more than that on the gold side and around $3 copper um, in the feasibility study that was uh, that was published by, by Nevson. So call it two and a half million dollars. That's for roughly a decade. Um, odds that they you know, find a little bit more and, and odds that uh, the metal price is higher, certainly the gold price is higher, would all be positive attributes to, to our expectations there. Uh, but the big money comes in when they get into the lower zone. There's no published date for when that will occur. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we all know the Chinese are aggressive. So we think that's likely to occur sooner rather than later. Now, with respect to Balia, there's no 43101 document, so I can't give specifics, but I can say that it's a 5,000 ton per day mill. We're expecting the ores uh, that come from our side, the royalty burden side of the, of the district, um, where they're going to be mining at very shallow levels as compared to the other side where they've mined the deposit out to 800 meters depth. Uh, that same body of mineralization transects across the border. There was a combination of the two projects together that's beneficial to us as royalty holders. Now we can take advantage of that infrastructure with respect to the tailings pond, the mill, et cetera, as well as the expertise on the metallurgical side 
Uh, these ores have already been tested and run through the mill, so we're very confident in their incipient recovery. They tend to average, they blend actually to average an 8% head grade, 8% combined lead zinc. It usually has about an 80 gram per ton silver credit. So if you do the math on uh, 5,000 tons per day, and let's say they're you know, able to achieve that 300 days a year or 320 days a year, mm-hmm. and you pick your, your lead and zinc price, maybe the average around a buck, a pound, and you pick your silver price, and you think about smelter fees, um, that works out to uh, two to five million dollars a year to EMX, um, uh, closer to the bigger number when it's in full-scale commercial production. Uh, but uh, we can't really give specifics until we have, um, you know, the, the 43101 document because they're once again they're a private Turkish company; they don't have to produce that. Um, but uh, of course, we'll be able to report when they uh, get the quarterly checks how much the checks are. <laughs> I look forward to that date. Yeah, but it's a it's a big uh, carbonate replacement deposit. Great grades. We've announced the drill holes. We'll announce more drill holes. So uh, it's it's not rocket science. Uh, you can do volumetrics by looking at the footprint and the zinc equivalent br- uh, numbers that we've put out on our website, um, and you can see the breadth of that mineralization. It continues to grow. And what's the sort of timeline for Balia? Just uh, yeah, the- they they've been slowed up by COVID a little bit, but not a lot. They were originally talking about first quarter of 21. I think I'm you know I'm gonna say now second, maybe third quarter. Mm-hmm. Okay, so actually Timok, Upper Zoma, and Balia. A r- in, roughly this, I mean, the same year coming into production. By the, by the end of the year, correct. Yeah. So what? So if you know, just taking ballpark numbers, you got three and a half million in recurring in- income right now. You're spending six to seven. These two are coming online. Looks yeah. like they would the gap. So even without a deal, it's likely that you'll be neutral um, yeah. if you maintain current spending um, in 18 months ish from now. Um, obviously, there's ramp ups. There's questions. Um, so that's an interesting. Um, foundation um, yes. again, that, that you stand in as you make decisions about this big bank account. And I know this is obviously an important question and you get it all the time about what you're going to do with this money to um, to create value for shareholders. Um, I don't want to ask you about what you're looking at because you're not going to talk about what you're looking at. One of EMX's strengths is thinking outside of the box. And if you tell us all what you're thinking, then other people will jump in the box with you. So it wouldn't work very well. Yeah, I'm um, happy. Yeah, that's okay. But do you want to talk also, whatever you can say in that sense, but also maybe about the sort of scale or um, or type of deal that you're looking at um, that you think would would make a difference to EMX's valuation? I mean, EMX is, to me, on that cusp of re-rating in the royalty space because of this proximity to free cash flow. So just talk a little bit about how those pieces all fit together um, to try and get EMX re-rated into the next tier of royalty companies. Yes, yeah, so it's nice to be in a position where we have the money in the bank so that we uh, you know, have this problem, right? So the, we're thinking about, you know, how do we allocate that capital? And, um, um, you know, we're value players. Uh, that's core to our, core to our approach. Um, and we would value current cash flow because I think the catalyst here that you're alluding to correctly is more cash flow is going to quicken the repricing event. And so certainly we're prioritizing that. Uh, that doesn't come inexpensively. And we're not keen to overpay, so that becomes a catch-22. Uh, but we're, you know, continuing to review the landscape of the world, uh, and we love gold. Everybody loves gold. Uh, we love copper long term. We're very bullish copper. We're very bullish copper long term. And uh, strategic metals, um, you know, and you can question what those are, but you know, certainly we like sulfide nickel. You know, we think that's a great place to be. And um, uh, the the uh, EV trend is real. It's, it, you know, there's gonna be more batteries built, and there's a lot of nickel in batteries. So and there's a lot of copper in batteries, and there's a lot of copper that you know is in all forms of the infrastructure that are needed for the EV revolution, as well as everything else that copper goes into. So these 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 are uh, great metals for us to be exposed to. So I think this continued increase in the presence on precious metals, strategic metals, and battery metals. And uh, any way that we can do that through our organic growth, through the acquisition of royalties, uh, most important to us is that the capital is astutely allocated. Um, we're prioritizing cash flow, but not to the point that we'll do something that is, we believe, inappropriate. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of interesting. The, the royalty space has absolutely ballooned in the last decade. Uh, I thought it had already done so by the end of 2019. And then in 2020, it has just taken, mm -hmm. gone to the next level in terms of the number of companies who are out there. Um, so, I mean, a similar question with th that came in is how does EMX compete if you don't want to overpay? Um, and I think, what was the other thing I was just about to say? Oh yeah, part of that to me is perhaps your strategic investment angle that has paid out very well. That's been an important part of your business model. So mm -hmm. I would guess that a balance between strategic investments and royalty deals is part of the calculation that you're going through as you as you look at opportunities. You know, and an interesting example of us thinking laterally along the lines you're talking about is our investment in Millrock. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing a great job uh, working as a prospect generator in Alaska. And we did a deal where we got royalties in addition to equity position. Um, and we think that was a, a quite good allocation of capital. And we love to invest in good people. And Greg Beischer is doing a great job there. So uh, that's one example, thinking laterally and, and doing a strategic investment that's paralleled with a royalty acquisition. Um, we're happy to explore other possibilities like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it really comes down to utilizing our our um, because the most important long-term value creator of a royalty is discovery optionality, and that comes back to economic geology expertise, and that's our alpha. Oh, fair enough. Um, well, it's been an hour. That's probably about where we should wrap things up. There's always more questions that I can have for Dave Cole, but uh, in the interest of, uh, of respecting people's time, I'd love to say thank you to everybody who tuned in. Hopefully it was useful. Um, I learned a few things, even though I try my best to know everything there is to know about EMX. So thanks, Dave, for taking the time to take us through the story today. Uh, thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions for either of us, we are easy to find. EMX's website has uh, great contact information, um, and those questions will make their way to Dave. And my website, it's easy to get a hold of me at resourcemaven.ca. So with that, uh, happy Thursday, everyone. Uh, be well, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Gwen.